We'll talk about uh, investing, how I invest my money, nine ways I'm going to share with you. Those of you who are on the last call, Oh, I think we lost Ty, guys. Maybe we'll just wait for one second. Um, we're going to let him know. Hold on, guys. We're going to have Ty rejoin here. Not sure what happened. So guys, uh, yeah, we, Ty will be back. He's, uh, his thing just crashed. And this is one of those things that is a, a Zoom, little Zoom issue. Um, but hang tight, he's coming back. I'm talking to him right now, he's just rejoining. Everyone on YouTube, I know we just, just went live and we crashed a little bit there, but Ty is coming back. I'm just going to sign back. Everyone on YouTube, I know we just, just went live and Sorry. We crashed a little bit there. We didn't get any feedback there. And yes, Ty will will be going live on Instagram too once he gets back up. Just a heads up. There we go. I see Ty is back, guys. So it'll just be one moment now. Okay, I'm back. There you go. Cool. My maid was connecting the power for my laptop and she unplugged the router. So there you go. Okay, so uh, what I was saying is, I was gonna show you guys this. This is the new version versus what I showed you guys last week. I'm gonna be going over this. So I'm gonna pull it up on my screen. This is really good stuff, I'm telling you. I put out a lot of stuff and I usually don't call my stuff good because I feel like it's too braggy, but this is actually like freaking one of the best things I've ever created. So for those of you who, or just logging in. Let, let me let me go live on Instagram while we're talking. <laughs> okay, welcome. We're live on Instagram. We're live on Zoom. We're live on YouTube. We're talking about this investing system that I use for my own money. I call it ABI. So here's, for those of you who were on the last call, I didn't, I was fleshing it out in my brain. Like, how do I teach people 
something that's not taught in school at all, which is how to invest your money and how to do it in a comprehensive way. So what I'm about to share with you is like literally um, a compilation of everything I've learned both in my own life, but also what I've learned about investing my money from really, really smart people. So some of them are billionaires. Um, some of them are worth, you know, a hundred million bucks. Some of them are worth a couple billion. So this is a compilation of kind of my life experience. I started with GE Capital. Um, people think of me as a social media influencer, but they don't realize like I've been in the game way before social media even existed. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm just going to jump into this. There's nine basic investment strategies. If you want to know everything in the world about investing, there's basically nine categories that you have to learn. Now, just to be clear, you don't have to learn all nine. You don't have to learn all nine right now. Okay. Um, so somebody said, Ty, America needs a good amount of socialism right now. If we want capitalism to keep thriving, America already has a lot of social socialism. I mean, you have social security, that's socialism. Um, there's many forms. I'm not going to get too much into politics, but just remember most people that talk politics don't know what they're talking about. Sadly, most people who talk economic systems can't even take care of their own finances. So be very, very be very careful who you listen to in this from the standpoint of <laughs> it's funny. People can't even manage their own finances, but they know exactly who should be president. They know exactly which economic system will work best. I'm like, bitch, you can't even fucking balance your own <laughs> bank account. What are you talking about? People are annoying. And the less people know, the more they talk. And my recommendation is you want to talk to people who have track record. It doesn't mean they know everything. No one person will ever know everything, but you need people with some level of track record. You know, that's what I do. It's like, if you need heart surgery, your grandma needs heart surgery. First thing you're going to do is say, Hey doctor, have you ever done heart surgery before? If some doctor's like, Oh no, but I, I study the different theories of, of medicine. You'd be like, wait, you have never done one heart surgery. I'm going to pass. Well, if you look at Twitter, it's a million people that have never done anything economically besides survive, which by the way, I'm not making fun of that because survival is part of the game. I'm just saying they're not really qualified to speak on what economic system would work, whether it be pure capitalism, pure socialism, libertarianism, some blend of all of those. Um, we already live in a world with a whole blend of, of these anyway. So it's an oversimplification, but I can tell you this, what is actually important that each of you watching this, this live call here on a Thursday in June, 2020, for those of you wondering if this is live uh, and real, I, I highly recommend that um, you master your own cash flow. That's what I recommend. Before you start worrying about who should be president, before you're going to vote on who should be president, vote on yourself. Okay. So let me share this. I just sent it to myself somewhere. I'm going to share this. Boom. Here's the new system. I'm going to shrink it down a little bit. This has nine things I'm going to talk on tonight or today. Some people, you'll see the Instagram slowly fades away. People on Instagram story want to be entertained. This isn't just entertainment. Somebody said, this isn't live because you look skinny. I am skinny right now. I'm cutting. I went up to like 205 pounds. Now I'm cutting down to 165. So I'm about 185 right now. So I'm vegan right now till September 1st. I like to change my diet around. Every diet gives you different benefits. For me, like vegan helps you, helps you cut off visceral fat, um, helps, low, helps with cholesterol, blood levels. Um, and then, you know, later in the year when I bulk up, I go like more keto or more paleo and I do like zone diet. I, I like the body's meant to mix it up. So I did have LASIK. These are glasses that have, um, blue blockers and they're like computer glasses staring at the screen ain't good for your eyes. Okay. I'm going to share my screen with one of my staff members, Danny Carranza, and, uh, I'll share on zoom. How much is a good amount of money to start investing? Uh, Zero dollars is a good amount. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, that's a good segue. I'm gonna tell you this. 
um, and Danny, we're not using that that Google Slides at all, really. Uh, you may have to lower your brightness or something a little bit or zoom in. Don't worry, I'm gonna zoom way in. I just want you to see the big picture. Now, let me preface everything I'm saying with this. If I could be 18 years old again and have a time machine, I would wanna be sitting right here in this chair or the chair you're in watching this because this is literally the, I could talk on many topics. I could talk about, you know, buying companies. I could talk about um, social media marketing. I could talk about e-commerce, but it, nothing matters if you don't know how to invest your money because then money will come in and money flows out the back. It, it's like goes in one door and comes out the back end and you got nothing left in your bank account. And so investing is the fine art of taking money and making it your servant. Warren Buffett says he remembers he was around, I forget what age, 12 years old. And he invested his money and all of a sudden it began to make him money. And so he said, this money is like a servant of mine an ethical servant. It's not like you're taking slavery, another human, you're taking an inanimate object, money, and it works for you. While you sleep, that money makes more money. That's So I want to go into the nine types of investment. Um, and let me just zoom in on these and then I'll share them. I'll come back and explain more. Okay, so I'm going to zoom way in. Uh, you should be able... This will zoom in here on Instagram in a second. Damn, Instagram lags a lot, huh? Okay, so the first thing you have are, is physical assets. The second thing you have are digital, or we could call them intangible assets. Okay, but I like digital from the standpoint of we live in a digital world. They used to call them intangible. I, I like digital. Okay, and then you have operating assets. So uh, these are assets that you actually put a little more time, energy, and effort into. So the top one here, when we go to these physical assets, um, you may have to put some operations in, as we'll see. So the three types of physical assets are real estate, uh, precious metals, real estate, precious metals, and cash and cash equivalents. You're going to have to know how to manage and invest real in real estate. You're going to have to understand precious metals, gold, silver, and other similar precious metals. Even diamonds could fall under that. Uh, and then you have cash and crack, cash equivalents. How you, how much cash should you keep? You know, what about money markets? Those are considered cash, cash equivalents, CDs, certificates of deposit. Okay, then you have digital assets. We have the three. We have the stock market, crypto, and IP. Traditionally, the stock market has been considered a physical asset, but I think in a modern world, it, it, you don't have stock certificates, you don't clip bond coupons anymore. So I think it makes sense that, that these fall, on, it's very much a digital world. So you have digital stock market, crypto. I'm working on a deal right now that will be closed with multi-millions of dollars of Bitcoin. No US dollars used in that deal. Okay, so crypto is continually riding uh, uh let me let me mute my hold on someone said savers are losers by robert kiyosaki i mean that's not totally true but we'll get into that a little bit all right so you have crypto and then you have ip this is something that very few people understand which it, ip stands for intellectual property this is patents trademarks licensing deals so there's three forms of that and i'll get into that ip is a sophisticated, I own a lot of IP, valuable IP, IP that's worth, and again, IP stands for intellectual property. It's not something you hold in your hand, but it's very valuable. Um, it can sell for 10, 20, 30 million dollars, okay, and, and more and more. A lot of the bankruptcies you see now, what will be sold out of those bankruptcies is IP, okay, so Let's go down here. Now, your last, you have operating assets. So what are operating assets? Okay, you have entrepreneurial operating assets. You have what I call M&A. For those of you who understand M&A, M&A stands for mergers and acquisitions. You can have operations where you buy things. And then you have operating assets you invest in, which are minority interests. You have to be very careful 
with the minority interest operating assets because um, as the title su suggests, you are in minority position and therefore uh, money can <laughs> money can be transferred outside of your reach unethically very easily. So you, you have to really be careful on the minority interest side. Okay, any questions here? Let me let me answer some quick questions, whether they be on Zoom or, or okay. Ty, will this program be available next year because my credit card is empty? Okay, yeah, so I have an advanced version. I'm doing the overview version today on the live call. I'll put a link later if you want to get in my ABI program, the investing program. And, um, but for now, I'm just going to give you a lot of free stuff. I know some of you don't have any money and that's fine. I started out broke, so I feel for you. Um, what's MA again? It's not MA, it's M and A, mergers and acquisitions. Okay. Somebody says it was mental assets. Yeah, I moved the mental assets into a different category. What do you think about Forex? Um, Forex is a subset of a digital assets that I talked about here under, I put it under stock market, even though it's a bit different. You know, you have futures, you have Forex, um, foreign currencies. Uh, you have, you know, futures, which are commodity based. There's all kinds, you have options, obviously. Okay. Ty, do you think Bitcoin will continue rising for the next 10, 10 to 20 years? I think so. My business partner, Alex, thinks no. I am more pro Bitcoin and he's anti Bitcoin. So we're friends and we disagree. Um, but I have never sold any of the Bitcoin that I've bought up to today. Maybe I will in the future. But from this point, you know, I believe. Now, if I get paid in the large Bitcoin transaction for a business, sometimes I have to convert it to cash because it's really a cash transaction. But I'm talking about my personal Bitcoin that I invest for my personal net worth outside of a business deal. Um, I've never sold and I don't really plan to sell. How much Bitcoin do you have? <laughs> it's a good question. I, 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 I don't tell that. Uh, there's certain things a man or a woman shouldn't tell. Even people like to Google my net worth. They like to Google people's net worth. Um, I guess I kind of understand why people do that, but um, yeah. Okay. Where are we? Uh, a few more questions. Let me turn on Instagram. Any questions before I jump deeply in? I'm just going to go one by one. Boom, 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 boom. Somebody said such pretty blue eyes. I don't have blue eyes, but thank you. Um, that might be from the reflection on here, but um, that's nice of you. Uh, what is it? Do you think Facebook Libra will affect Bitcoin? Not really. In general, if more people roll out crypto that's actually used, it'll actually help. Like if Libra gets big and is used, it'll help Bitcoin and vice versa. It, that's not how things work. Not everything's completely competitive. So for example, somebody said nice haircut. My hair is going curly these days. Like when I was a little kid, I had curly hair. When I let it grow out and it's hot, my hair goes curly. Um, can I see the whole free chart? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to show it more. And for those of you in the ABI program, I'm rolling out like 15 hours of, of in-depth training. So I'll put the link for that. Um, hey, there's somebody at Heidi. Somebody's at my, my door. I'm staying in South Beach at a condo here, hotel condo on the beach. So is that the maze? That's the maze. I travel with my own assistant. Yeah. Oh, okay. The trash people are here. What do I think about virtual reality? That is a subset of operating assets. Uh, yes. Who's Heidi? That's my assistant. She usually travels with me. How do you know if it's the right investment to keep things going? Don't try to time things. You just want to get in. Man, if I could be 18 years old, let me tell you this. Each of you, this is my dream for each of you. That one day I meet you in person somewhere on the street or at a conference or something. 
and you say to me, Ty, I am asset heavy, not ass heavy, not A-S-S, -S. asset, asset. The definition of an asset, there, there's many definitions of an asset, but the one we're going to use for the purpose of this conversation we're going to use the, an asset. So you have income and you have asset-based income. So you have labor income. Everything you've learned in your life, if you were like me and your parents learned, was labor-based income. You show up at work, you get paid. Even as an entrepreneur, a lot of you, in fact, most people that you'll ever meet, 99% of their money comes from uh, uh, labor-based income. I need you to have less labor-based income and more asset-based income. So asset-based income are things that generate income for you, cash flow, but you're not really spending 40 hours a week on it. You're maybe spending two hours a week, one hour a week, three hour a week. So for example, I have an asset that I own. It's an operating asset. Um, it's called MentorBox. I launched it in 2016, me and my business partner, Alex. We have 70,000 people on, uh, on auto rebilling, automatic credit card subscriptions, okay? And I spend one hour a week on that business maximum. So four hours a month. So that puts it as an asset. That's not labor-based. Four hours a month is not labor. It's not a job. Four hours a month. So... I, 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 Tim Ferriss wrote a good book called The Four Hour Work Week. Well, an asset is more like four hour a month, especially eventually. At the beginning, sometimes you have to put more work into it. Someone said they love mentor box. Great, thank you. So, my goal is that you guys are asset rich. I have many assets. I just bought two, I'm closing this week on two warehouses. They are assets. I will put in one hour a year of work. We sign long, you know, warehouses, you can sign long-term leases with large corporations or like Krispy Kreme used to rent this warehouse. And so that is an asset. It's not labor-based. I'm not doing, now I do, you, you may have to do a lot of work at the beginning. I call that front-loaded. Um, I have a, a company called Farmer's Cart. Okay. I have a company called Dress Barn. Dress Barn is a company I bought, did, did 740 million revenue last year. And Dress Barn I spend one hour a week on. The reason I say I spend one hour a week is I have one conference call per week with the CEOs of each of the companies that I am the majority shareholder in. And so those are assets for me. Today, while uh, uh, I'm not going to say which business it is, but I haven't even looked. Let me look here. Give me a second. Um, I'll show you a Shopify account, what one of these assets is doing for me Let's look at yesterday, for example, because today's not over. I won't say which brand this is. Let me turn my brightness down. This is not a screenshot. This is an actual live. You can see I can refresh it. So it, yesterday did $133,000 in revenue. Today, it's already done $117,000. So that's an asset that's working for me right now while I'm on this call with you. Okay. Somebody see, can't see it on the main screen. I'll hold it. Long time. 117,000. That's today. And then yesterday did 133. So that's an operating asset that I have. Tire, your CEOs paid performance based? Yes. And they have equity in the business too. Okay. I think I've answered a lot of questions. That's just one of my assets. One of my assets. You know, uh, my operating assets. I mean, there's levels to business, right? There's levels to asset. Some people are a white belt. Let me ask you guys, how many assets do you have, do you own that are not labor-based? Meaning income comes from them without you having to spend more than a couple hours a week. Can somebody just write down a number? Somebody says, and, and if you have, somebody said that a hundred assets, don't count a hundred different stocks as a hundred assets. In this case, of these categories of nine, I mean, that's kind of a cheating way. If you buy the S&P 500 or you buy some kind of index fund, you, yeah, you have <laughs> a lot of, a lot. someone said their girlfriend. Okay, so your girlfriend is an asset, a financial asset. Are you, do you make her work for you? 
that doesn't count. Human slavery doesn't count. You will notice I do not have in my nine category here, human slavery, okay? So your girlfriend doesn't count. Somebody wrote girlfriend is a liability. Somebody's got a pimp in the chat. Um, zero, but working on my first one, working harder on my e-com store, but yet to find a winning product. Okay, that'll be an operating asset. One Lambo and $1 million. Okay, Lambo is not an asset. Uh, unless it's like a collector type of Lamborghini. I have a Lamborghini here in Miami. It's not an asset. That's why you should lease them. A lot of people flipped out in 2016 because they're like, 2015, they're like, this guy rents a Lamborghini. I'm like, no, I don't rent it, but I do lease it because anything that's not an asset, you should lease. People are stupid. People are like trying to call me out on stuff that they were, I was right about. <laughs> Imagine getting called out. Wait, you're like, one plus one is two. And someone's like, they said it's two. Ha ha ha. I'm going. That's just, it really shocked me how stupid the world was, but I should have known. You want to lease liabilities. In fact, there, the owner of Maxim was one of the wealthiest guys in the world. And he, um, he's dead now, but Felix uh, Dennis was his name. He had this, this, if, this 3F rule. If it floats, flies, or Fs, I won't say what that stands for, you should lease it, don't own it. And what he was saying is you don't really want to own a boat because a boat is a liability. It depreciates. Um, good assets don't depreciate the appreciate. So like a jet, yeah, a jet, like um, I either charter, or I'm working on a lease of a jet. A lease is more long-term, like one year. Okay. So I actually am negotiating a lease but I, you don't want to own a plane. I'll tell you this, you get one crack in the windshield on a plane and it's like $30,000. Or you have to upgrade the system because you want to fly to Europe. The navigation, that's two hundred dollars to $400,000. So it's better to lease stuff. And then you can, for tax purposes, you can write more off. It depends if you can depreciate a purchase. The laws change a lot. Okay, but that's not relevant for this. Boat, the same thing, owning a yacht, is just for ego. Um, so let's go. Okay, so and, and also you wanna lease anything that's overpriced. Lease anything that's overpriced. So if there's a house you need to live in for whatever reason, and the owner wants 5 million and it's only worth 100,000, then you lease it and you can usually lease it for cheap. You only buy things in general when you can buy them for less than their value. That way on day one, you have, um, you know, you have appreciation. I mean, you have a, yeah, instant appreciation. Someone said kids are liabilities. This is not true. Kids are not liabilities because kids appreciate. Kids get older, they get smarter. So I think that's wrong. Um, okay, let, let's go into the, let's just get into this. I think I froze on Instagram. Instagram, it's funny. Okay. All right, I'm back. Let's jump into this. Let's start here at the top. So I'm going to zoom in to the, one of the nine assets and let's talk about real estate. All right. So real estate, here's the complexity around real estate. Number one, there's many, many types of real estate. So people, a lot of people talk about real estate like it's one thing. They're like, oh, I'm a real estate investor. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's the, it's not that simple. You have, for example, multifamily, you have single family home, you have um, development deals where you buy land and you build it into a subdivision. You have commercial real estate. You have, I would put hotels in their own category, even though maybe you can put them under development. Um, you have agricultural and then you have specialty real estate, like oil and gas. You would buy things. Um, one of the wealthiest families in the world or in history, what they did, or, or men in the world, um, there was a movie about him recently. He controlled all this real estate in the Middle East. And of course, there was oil on it. Uh, J.D. Rockefeller became the richest man in the world, $600 billion net worth in modern dollars. And he owned all, he started by buying um, oil-rich farmland in Pennsylvania. 
and he expanded across the Northeast. And so real estate is very diverse. Like my main expertise is in agricultural real estate. I've been to 40 countries working on deals, agricultural related. So you buy land and that land hold value and, the, and it produces agricultural product, whether it be timber or crops or animal, you know, and livestock. So I, for example, in the last couple of years, I bought up 850 acres in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It's kind of prime farmland in the world. So the things you need to know is you need to know what type of real estate you want to specialize in. Um, and right now I'm focused on agricultural and warehouses and warehouses is a subset of commercial real estate. Commercial real estate, for those of you who don't know, is real estate that is sold, um, uh, that is generates income from business leases, as opposed to multifamily home or single family home where individual people are paying you rent. So in a way, like I said, hotels is kind of a specialty, but all the shopping centers in the world and the shopping malls, um, which are, in, by the way, a lot of trouble, Simon Properties, I just was bidding on a deal versus Brookfield and Simon Properties. Uh, they own most of the shopping centers or the most in the United States. So that's every, with real estate, you really got to narrow down. What do I want to be good at? The reason I like agricultural real estate is because I know a lot about it. <laughs> that's a great reason to, be, to pick something. You should pick things around where you have expertise. Now, if you don't have any, any expertise, then you should pick things around your personality type. So for example, if you like dealing with people, single family home and multifamily may be your specialty. If you're a social person, you're extrovert, an extrovert, you're gonna manage your own property. You're gonna have to talk to a lot of people. You're gonna have to talk to people that are not paying your rent. You're gonna have to talk to them nicely and talk to them meanly. <laughs> That's not a word, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and so, but if you're an introvert, you may like kind of what I do, like farmland, not many people involved. And the people you do deal with are introverts. Um, co commercial real estate to me is a very dangerous one to be in right now because of COVID. Now there, that means there is, uh, there is big opportunities. If you can convert a lot of the commercial, commercial real estate to either warehouses or residential, there's a big opportunity. there. So step one, you really have to build expertise around picking what type of real estate investing you're going to become an expert in. That, that's hard. How, how many people on this planet right now you think are doing what their destiny is? 1% of the world? Well, in real estate, you don't have a destiny to be good. I've never met somebody in real estate that's good at everything. Never, ever. Maybe they exist. I've never heard of them. You know, I had a, a, a mentor. He's still alive now. He's in his 70s. He made $2 billion mostly in mobile homes, which is another subset of residential real estate and in shopping centers. And he did a REIT roll up for $2 billion. Basically means he kind of exited tax free for $2 billion. Very intelligent, but his expertise pretty much stopped after, is that commercial? He did some hotels, but if you ask him about multifamily homes, he doesn't like it. He doesn't do it. I had another mentor, a guy who built a lot of downtown Portland, Oregon. He built skyscrapers, that's his specialty. And he says there's very almost nobody competing with him in the skyscraper game. He's built, I, he took me to some like six skyscrapers, you know, huge downtown building. I'm talking <laughs> whatever, 60 floors or 50 floors, whatever it is. And uh, I know nothing about that. And that's all he knew. And he also did nursing and retirement homes, which is another form of residential real estate. So just Imagine real estate is a rabbit hole that you can travel down for a long time. Long, and a lot of real estate has its own terminology that doesn't cross over. For example, agricultural real estate, you're learning things, you're, you know, you're looking at leases uh, based on, sometimes are based on the amount of pounds cattle puts on in a year. Okay, that's called for gain. And a person who knows how to build hotels and do hotel and, and hospitality real estate understands nothing about that. So pick well, pick well. I think a good place to start can be single family homes. Why? Well, you probably live in a home, so you have some expertise in a home. Maybe you've fixed your own 
you know, the toilet was clogged and you fixed it, or there was a leak in the plumbing and you fixed it. So you have a little bit of expertise around management. Now, that brings us to the second thing here on real estate, you see negotiating. Now, this is a skill set that they should teach at school. I'm going to tell you, negotiating starts and finishes with psychology. One of the things you'll notice if you follow me is that to me, the greatest business skill you build is not a business skill. It's, it's psychology. If you're good at psychology, you can basically get good at any area of business because all business is, is interaction with other people. That's it. That's it. So even if you're doing introverted type real estate deals, whether it be commercial or raw land or big you know, oil leases in the middle of Alaska or something like that, pipeline leases, you're still, still having to deal with somebody at the other end. So how do you get good at reading people? A lot of people think it's stuff like body language and tonality. There is some truth to that, but that's a very amateur approach. And I find it interesting, like everybody trying to be good at reading people and psychology really goes deeply into body language. Just think about this, the human, if you study, <coughs> if you study evolutionary psychology, guess what? There's a principle called hawks and doves. And hawks and doves basically means there's people who are out to get you. That's the hawks. And there's people who are innocent. That's the doves. And we've had an evolutionary battle for 50,000 years plus where we've been trying to get over on other people, get the better deal, even before capitalism existed. So if it was as simple as reading people, where you just go, this means I'm not interested. And if I lean forward, I am interested. That's such a simple, pedantic understanding of body language that it would be easy to fool. The whole point of, of evolutionary psychology and understanding reading people, people are hard to read. You have to build a real expertise. People go to school for 12 years to become a doctor. You think it's easier to understand psychology and reading people? Do you think it's easier or harder? My answer is it's equally as hard. So you might have to spend 12 years really learning how to read people. And I wish it was just so simple. Oh, if the person smiles a lot, if the person mirrors me, then ah, bullshit. That's not, it's not that simple. It's much more, it's more like game theory. So it's like branching theory. If somebody does this, then you have to segment their heuristical type. Heuristical type is personality type. So for example, you can use different modes of categorizing people. You can use Myers-Briggs system, which is a, is a 16 personality type basis. So you have like EN, ENTP, ENFP, ENFJ, INFJ, ISFP, ESFP, there's all these. And that's one way you can use things like Hexaco score, which is a 25 facet understanding of human personality. You can use the Mach 4 quiz, which basically is a Machiavellian type quiz to see if people are sneaky and liars. You can look at narcissistic MPI, Narcissistic personality inventory. Um, you need to know the Levinson psych psycho uh, psychopathy um, rating that people have. You need to understand the dark triad. So if you this sounds confusing for you, it is. This is I'm telling you black belt level stuff. White belt level stuff is like oh I, I read a book on body language, so I know how to negotiate a real estate deal. Not really. If you come negotiating as me and you just try to use my body language. You're not going to end up well. You're not, you're not, you're not going to end up on the right side of that deal. So anyway, I don't have time. That would take a, that's a separate long conversation as to really understanding at least, you know, and I do jujitsu and you have white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belt, coral belt, red belt. I'd like each of you at some point in your life to become at least a blue or purple belt in reading people and, and understanding psychology. I've spent a lot of my life focused on it. So Maybe I'm a black belt, but it took me a long time to get here. It took me a lot of reading, took me mentors, and it took me a lot of in the field experience of how to do that. So I would just challenge you over the next year, if you want to make more money, you really got to become a student of the brain. The human brain is complex. My One of my business partners, Dr. Fresco, um, he has a PhD in neuroscience and um He's published in like nature or like neuron. He's like one of the top brain. He said, Ty, the brains, we know more about outer space than we know about the human brain. 
That's how complex we know more about our solar system than we know about the human brain is extremely complex. So don't ever think you're just going to instantly become a master by reading one book or something or listening to one call. You have to become a student of the game. It's the same with investing, student of the damn game. Meaning every day you get a little skill built. Every day you become a learning machine. That's what you have to become. Okay. Now, thirdly, once you select the type of real estate and then you learn how to really read people so you know, for example, in negotiating a real estate deal, you have to know some, whether somebody's bluffing or not. I, I worked on a deal and the guy wanted 30, this is not real estate, this is for a business. The guy wanted, uh, I'll change the numbers a teeny bit so you won't know what deal it is, but it's around this level. The guy wanted $45 million. And then I was, I got him down to 35 million. And then I got him down to 30. And uh, I got him all the way down in the 20s. And um, that, if you push too hard on people and you think negotiation is just, okay, they asked for 40, I'll offer them five, people will just leave. People will leave. So you can't be too aggressive in negotiating because you piss people off. And once humans become emotional, as we know, all logic goes out the door. You might have the best offer and they'll literally not sell you the, the asset. So you can't be too aggressive, but you can't be too, you can't be a pushover. So most of negotiation is walking this super, super tight line and understanding the person's psyche. First of all, you got to determine whether you're talking to a truthful person or a liar. That's the most important. If you study game theory, you have to know that they call it a, a defector, somebody who defects. So somebody who cheats. Lying is a subset of cheating and defecting. So all these asset classes, real estate, gold, not so much the digital ones because you're buying them in a virtual, but all the operating ones and all the physical ones for the most part, you're going to have to deal with people. You're going to have to negotiate. You're going to have to know on a one to 10, should I be a 10 of aggressive or should I be a five of aggressive? I have deals where I'm not aggressive at all and I come out with the best deal. Um, I did a deal like that for the, you know, under $10 million and uh, I people offered more than $10 million, but they gave the deal to me because I wasn't, they didn't perceive me to be an asshole. So just understand the game of being a hard nosed negotiator can backfire on you like that. It just whips around 360. And you thought you were such a good negotiator because you were a hard ass because you read some book of a guy who's like, oh, I just negotiate so hard. And then you lose the whole deal. I've seen that happen. Like right now. <laughs> Real time in the last 12 months, I've seen that happen. Now, real estate, then you got to build an operations company. I, on real estate, is a great place to have a business partner that's older than you, that, that has a proven track record of doing real estate deals. That's all my real estate. I started, I did my first real estate deal in 2000, I think six or five, might have been five. Um, and I did it with a business partner, John DeWar, and, um, and he knew a lot more about real estate. We started buying up single family homes. His background was in commercial real estate. Operating real estate is the greatest place. It's the easiest place to buy, find a business partner because there's a lot of older people that have built skill in real estate, much more than there is in operating assets. So physical assets, real estate, op, it's easy to, it's easier to find somebody who, who runs the real estate or manages it for you, okay? Uh, in that category than it is in any other category. Okay, I want to move on from this because I'm going to run out of my, yeah, my voice is going to run out here. <laughs> so any, let me turn on the, que the, the, any questions on real estate? Oh, have, have I not been sharing my screen this whole time? Okay. Let me share my screen again. I just noticed. Let me see if Danny's there. I don't even know how it. How did that happen, Danny? Okay. Chats here. Hi, Ty. What's the minimum amount of money to start in real estate? There's a lot of real estate you can start doing now with owner finance deals. A lot you can do. Um, what about condo hotels? So if you want, I would be very careful 
buying condo hood condos are a great way to lose money because there's lower barrier to entry. So for example, here in Miami, they build up condos up and down the whole damn thing. So you gotta be very, very careful when it comes to certain types of, of real estate um, and specifically condos. I, you're better off in things that are hard, harder to replace. What'd somebody say about hotels? Somebody said, Ty, I work at BH Photo. Thank you. Okay, expand upon owner finance strategies, please. I'll give you examples of where I have done owner financed deals, okay? Um, in fact, one of the warehouses that I'm buying now is owner financed. I'm gonna put down 15%. They're gonna care, they're gonna, so let, I won't tell you the exact price, but let's just use a round number. So a million dollar warehouse. I'm gonna put down 15%. 150,000. Why am I going to put in 15? If you try to do zero money down and they have a broker or a realtor involved, then there's not enough money to cover the broker. So usually you have to put at least 5% down. There are times, by the way, when there's no broker that you can get away with a zero money down deal. But in general, I don't like to offer zero money down because people are very suspicious. Um, what happened to my com Oh, there's the comments. Okay, um, so I offer like between five and 20% down. Then I like to have a note that's amortized over 30 years. So it makes the payment lower, but it has a balloon payment in let's say 10 years. That way the owner knows they're gonna get all their money in 10 years, but the, the principal and interest you're paying is as if it was 30 years. If you don't understand what amortization, I don't have time to explain it, but that's is, is an example. So what I'm doing on this deal, I think it's either eight or 10 year um, balloon payment. That means at the end, you either have to refinance it or come up with the rest of the cash. And it's a 30 year amortization. So you're paying down some of the, the balance over time. And I try to get my, in, I try to do my interest. Sometimes I'll, I'll be a little more generous on giving them higher interest to incentivize them to do an owner finance deal. But that's what I'm doing on one of these warehouses. Another one of them, it's a smaller deal. I'm just going to pay it in cash, I think. I didn't, we were going to do it financed, but the bankers are, it's in a new area of the United States that I haven't done deals and bankers are super suspicious right now. So no matter what you show them, they're like, oh, you know, and I just didn't, I called the banker and I was like, forget it. I'll just pay cash. He was all depressed because he was like, no, 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 no. I was like, forget it. I'm done. I can't handle working with you. Um, so, that I hope that answers. What about restaurants? Be very careful with restaurants. It's a great way to lose money. I want to own a hotel. What should I do? Start with a very, 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 very small building. If you could get away with Airbnb, once Airbnb's uh, kind of legal in more places or open back up from COVID, I would start with that, man. Is wholesale best to start out? Okay, you're talking about is wholesaling real estate? Yeah, someone says so you yeah wholesaling real estate is a whole I don't wholesale real estate um but I I there's I had a real estate program and we had people in there that teach wholesaling wholesaling is basically like you control the contract and you flip the contract by the way that's not even you can wholesale anything not even real estate you can wholesale IP you can wholesale any asset um how do you invest in real estate with a partner without it becoming your job well, that's the whole point of having the partner. You see, you want a partner that wants to run a lot of business. Now, if you guys are starting off, it's fine to be more active. Ty, what about land? I love land. Land's just trickier. Land's trickier is a real estate investment because in general, land doesn't have an income base. So like banks don't want to lend on it as much. Um, now, if you're doing something like oil and gas or it's a different, but in general, do not start with raw land. Although I had, there's a guy who invests in my, some of my deals, I think his name is John Jasniak. He has a whole system of how you can start doing land. He has a system where you basically owner finance the land, then you resell, you break up the land and sell it for more, uh, a monthly cash flow that's more than you're paying. So it's an arbitrage. He has an arbitrage deal. Okay. Let's keep going here. I'm going to go down. Let me turn the comments back off. So let's talk about precious metals. Okay. 
gold, silver, and other. And I'm gonna have to go a little faster. I've spent a little bit too much time on real estate to get through these nine and each of them has two or three conversations. I mean, subtopics. So here's the thing about precious metals. If you look at the big asset managers right now, Guggenheim, for example, Guggenheim Investment Bank out of New York City, they manage about $300 billion. They're not quite a trillion dollar fund like Black, uh, trillion dollar asset company like BlackRock or uh, like BlackRock's seven trillion, but they're big, 300 billion is big. Their chief investment officer, he just dropped or reallocated the portfolio through COVID into gold, like 60, 70% into gold and came out like a bandit because gold, let me show you guys a gold chart. Um, if we just look at gold chart, what is it doing? I mean, it's, uh, it's insane right now. In fact, the last time, if you look at 20 years, we're at, this is by the kilo, um, or you can look at it by the ounce, so, uh, a kilogram or the ounce. So you have, it's at 1700. And in 2001, it was at 260 bucks. It peaked here post recession, like 2011. It was about, we've reached about the same place as we were in 2011. And so what happens is when, the Fed starts to print a lot of money. People are worried about inflation. If you don't know what inflation is, basically think of it this way. If you were paying for something um, with rocks, a certain beautiful white rock, and all of a sudden, so let's say there's only five rocks in your neighborhood and everybody loved white rocks, but there's only five of them and you had all five. You might be able to buy you know, go to a restaurant and be like, I don't have any money, but I'll give you this white rock. And they're like, wow, it's so rare. It's so precious. Everybody around me loves this white rock. There's only five of them. I'll take one rock and I'll cook you food. You don't have to give me any cap. But what happens if all of a sudden somebody discovers a huge pile of white rocks, a hundred thousand of them. Now you go to the restaurant and you're like, Hey, I give you one rock for a meal. And the guy's like, dude, those rocks are everywhere. Why? I don't care about one rock. There's a hundred thousand that I found in my backyard when I was digging a hole. So all of a sudden, the white rock doesn't become precious anymore. Well, the US government now, because of COVID, is getting ready or has already printed crazy amount of money. We're talking, you know, they, they, they can print trillions of dollars. So all of a sudden, the value of the US dollar might go up down. So if you have a home that was valued at 500,000, that sounds great, but what if, what if 500,000 isn't worth as much what if you go to, when my great, my step-grandfather was born in 1916 in Ohio, and he told me when he was a little boy, he remembers, you could do anything with a dime. He's like, you could get a meal and then go see a movie for 10 cents. 10 cents. What can you do now with 10 cents? Who even keeps dimes? I, I, people, <laughs> I heard some comedian, he's like, I found some coins in my pocket. And I was like, what is this heavy trash? He like threw it in the trash. Now, that sounds like a joke, but what's the value of a penny right now, man? What can you do with a penny? Nobody, if you give somebody a penny, are they going to say thank you? No, people are like, you keep it. I don't even want a penny. So, yeah, 100 years ago, when my step-grandpa was born, 1916, 104 years ago, a penny was a nice little deal. You would stop and pick up a penny. But inflation's been killing us every single day. Well, I mean, we went off the gold standard in 1913, I believe, when the Federal Reserve was formed. Um, just to be clear, there was in there was recession pre. <laughs> there's been a recession every four years since 1776, the formation of the U.S. You know, as a country. So don't think that it's some um, it, the Fed is responsible for all. But in fact, there was there's less frequent recessions now than there was in the 1800s. You can Google it. I think there's been. In the 1800s, there was a recession every three to four years. But anyway, gold, silver is a strong hedge because all the gold in the world can fit on one boat, 16 meters square. All the gold in the world can fit, I believe it's 16 meters square. That's how rare gold is. That's why some people call gold God's money. Because gold's been around before the U.S. government. A thousand, I just read a book in the seven, uh, it was set in the 1750s, the story of Casanova, the famous guy, uh, Jacques Casanova. He was paying over gold, in gold. I've been to Bolivia, the Potosi, the largest, the highest city 
in the world by altitude. It was a silver mine. And the Spanish empire was built from that one silver mine, slavery. They would force the Quechua Indians to go underground till they died and brought them silver. And, uh, but that was, you know, that's 1400s, even pre, pre 1400, pre Columbus. Uh, or maybe that was post Columbus, I may be wrong. But gold's been being used for, uh, and precious metals have been being used. Even the Native Americans, they didn't use gold. They used seashells. There was a type of seashells called wampum. And that was, so precious things that are rare. So you want to have some investment in gold and silver. You shouldn't allocate 90% of your savings into gold. Um, but, you know, if you look at a traditional investment model, about 5% should go into alternative assets. Some of which, some of that could be gold. And a lot of uh, high net worth billionaires and a lot of hedge fund, man uh, sorry, um, uh, fund managers or people, who, wealth managers are allocating money into gold, but they don't teach you this in school. Silver similar. We look at a silver chart. It's done fairly similar here. Let's look here. Silver spot prices. So 20 years. It's at $17.41 from $4. Notice one thing, gold and silver will not be your best investment ever. There's plenty of things that perform better, Amazon stock. But gold and silver in ways is less risky because a company can become worth zero. How much is JCPenney stock worth? How much is GNC stock worth? GNC declared bankruptcy. Let's look at, look at the GNC ticker. Once you declare bankruptcy or close to bankruptcy, your stock goes to basically zero. It's at 66 cents. So the beauty of it, it was at $50 five years ago. And it's at zero or under a dollar. So the beauty of gold and silver is it's not going to do this because it's, um, it is a less, it is a more rare and irreplaceable asset than GNC. GNC can declare chapter 11 or sometimes they'll liquidate under chapter seven and they'll reinvent themselves. You see that with Sears has reinvented themselves multiple times. Um, Sharper Image went through chapter 11 and what they call chapter 22, which is going bankrupt again, whereas gold is just not, and silver, that's not gonna happen. So that's just something. All right, quick question, any question? There's other precious metals that we can talk about. I mean, there's many, many, many. there's aluminum. I mean, these things become commercial grade stuff, but I think these, this, this is a good kind of opening. Let me open up the questions real quick. I'm also, I wanna, I'm gonna put the link by the way, in a second um, to my full program. I'm trying to give you guys as much as I can here in, in an hour or two uh, for free. But those of you who really wanna go deep, which I recommend every human on planet earth, go deep with this. Go, like this is, I was talking to somebody, goes to NYU yesterday. $80,000 a year if you don't have scholarships. She has some scholarships, so it's 30,000. With scholarships, one year for a bachelor degree. And I'm going, I'm trying to get people educated here for a couple hundred bucks and people give me a hard time. I'm going, okay, go to, go to NYU. You won't learn any of this. Copper, platinum, yes. Uh, uh, do you own physical gold? So you can, gold can be, you can do many ways with gold. So you can own, for example, you can own gold within an IRA. You can own GLD, which is a security, right? So you can own things linked to gold. You can own gold mine stocks is a way to be involved in gold. Uh, you can own coins. Uh, so many, you can do storage. So basically you buy physical gold and, if you don't want to keep it in your house because you don't want to get robbed, there's people who will store it for you. You can also put it in a, in a bank. Okay. Can you go back to the flow chart? Yeah, let me go back here. Okay. Where can you buy a physical gold bar? There's many places you can buy gold. Um, I'm working on buying a big gold company right now. I don't own it yet, or I would tell you you could get it there. Um, if you look at gold, I mean, a really common place that people look here. So if you just look up GLD, okay? 
So that's that's a place a lot of people GLD is bouncing around. These little spiders. Okay. All right. Somebody called me a soy boy. What is a soy? You think I'm a soy boy? <laughs> Definitely. Right now I'm vegan for three months, but that don't make me a soy boy. I was benching three rep in 315. That's not a soy boy. Send your video. See if you can bench, Mr. Non Soy Boy. My uncle owns a string of pawnbrokers. We'll get to that. Um, yeah, just to be clear, I'm not vegan forever, but I do it. I cycle with vegan. And a little bit of soy won't hurt you. Prolonged soy, they say, can give you higher estrogen. But longest lived people in the world are from Okinawa. The most people over age 100, and they eat soybeans. So they seem to be okay. <laughs> um, King Grodion says he benches 315. Good. Send your video. Are you talking about 315 pounds, ounces? What are we talking about? What's up, Grant Cardone? Grant said, one day I'm going to be like Ty Ty. Grant, we're talking about real estate. We were talking about agricultural real estate like I do. Of course, Grant is a big king man in the multifamily space. So Grant likes to buy big, uh, you know, large multifamily properties all across the United States. I'm not sure if Grant's global right now, but I know he's big, you know, all, one of the bigger ones in the U.S. So, uh Grant's been getting in shape too, boy. Grant, I heard you're ben benching six or 700 right now, man. You gotta catch up. I'll tell you one thing. Now that I'm vegan and I'm cutting weight, I lost a lot of strength. Like right now I rep like 205 or 215. If I'm, if I'm like eating 4,000 calories a day, then, you, then I, you get way stronger, boy. You get fatter, but you get stronger. That's why you look at the strongest people in the world they don't have really six packs. <laughs> They're big boys. They got a little bit of a belly, you know. Uh, okay, green smoothies every day. That's what I like it. Food trucks are good investment. Yes, we'll we'll talk about that. Well, I don't know if I can go live. With, let me see if Grant's trying to go live. He might. I'm not sure if he's here. Let's see. Oops. Oh, we'll have to go off. Grant, let me know if you're still on here. My mentor is Brian Mark, Mark Fit. Really good coach. Do you know him? I do not. But uh, don't worry. Just because I don't know somebody doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of people I don't know that are doing badass stuff. I try to mind my own business as much as I can. There's so many people who are like, oh, do you know this person? And uh, I'm actually trying to get less social media followers. I've already gotten a lot of um, social media and it's just like, it comes with headaches, dude. Do you really want everybody to know who you are? I have a philosophy. You only want people to know you that you're interested in meeting. You don't want all every weirdo in the world to know who you are. You wanna be very covert when it comes to most of planet Earth. And that's the one thing I don't like about social media. I'm like, man, I gotta be known by every whack job I mean, mostly good people, but I got to be known by every whack job on planet Earth. Uh, there's no upside in that. There's only downside. But there's upside in, in, I call it targeted fame. All of you should want targeted fame. You should want to be known by everybody that you respect. The, the greatest thing of social media, and honestly, is I can get into any club anywhere in the world. Like almost all the bouncers follow me. So that's a good thing, but that's not worth that's not worth the hassle. Um, every once in a while it runs it. But that's what I said. You want everybody in the world to know you that you respect. So if you respect Grant Cardone, you want Grant Cardone to know you. But do you want whatever this ding dong guy that was talking about soy boy or something? Do I want soy boy man to know who I am? No, I want soy boy man to follow somebody else. I'll give them to some other. Who wants to be an influencer and have soy boy man? You guys could have him, the guy who said I'm a soy boy. 
which reminds me, I need to eat more soy. I hardly eat any soy, man. Because I've been drinking almond milk instead of soy milk. When I'm not vegan, I got my own cows. I drink full fat Jersey cow milk that we milk by hand on my farm. Grass fed. I know where it come from. No pesticides. Nothing in the milk. No BST in the milk. Nothing. Okay, let's go back here to... Let's go back. Let's talk some more business. Who's bored? Oh, let me... I'm going to throw something up here. Someone said soy is bad. I already took cover of this. It is not bad, please. Too much of anything is bad. You, you Ain't nobody low on testosterone because they eat <laughs> edamame. <laughs> People read some dingy article. You really think some dude eats edamame and his test cuts in half? Come on, man. You guys have been reading too much men's fitness bullshit written by some, <laughs> or some reporter who doesn't know anything. He Googles another guy who Googles another guy. That's how articles get written now. Ain't nobody lose it all. Now, if you ate pure soy all the time, you're going to, you know. Have I tried fruititarian? I've done fruititarian a little bit. My brother's a uh, fruititarian. And I don't think you should be fruititarian forever. But like a month of fruititarian, boy, that'll cut your fat right off your stomach. <laughs> It'll cleanse your bowels, my friend. People want to go on a bowel cleanse. I'm like, go fruitarian. Eat 20 apples a day, 20 bananas a day. It'll cleanse you right out. People are like, oh, I can't go to the bathroom. I'm like, okay, let's hit that fruitarian, my friend. Most, th if you do things in balance, you're fine, you know? But if you go and eat, lived on edamame, you, you, I can tell you this, I grow soybeans on my farm. Soybeans are incredibly healthy food. They're the highest protein grain in the world. People don't know that. So soy, soy got protein. I use a shake also that has um, hemp protein is underrated, my friend. Hemp is a great one. Steve Jobs died because of that. Yeah, because he went fruitarian. Well, nobody knows if that's true, but you can't be fruitarian. Um, but certainly soybeans are not your problem never met a dude who's like dude i'm strong as shit and i'm like what happened you're like i went to a sushi place man and they had him damn it upon me and i grabbed 10 pieces i just woke up the next day and my ball shriveled up i had no testosterone man i i couldn't lift i couldn't bench anymore i was benching the bar after that okay <clears throat> Let's get back to, I'm going to put up a link here real quick. What is my link? Let me find it here. I'm going to put up a link for the full program. I, I'm about done building out, I think, the ultimate program I wish I had been uh, given when I was 18. It's my ABI program, Asset Based Income Master Plan. It's literally the master plan that I use every single day every single day uh to invest my money and i'm going to train you on all nine of these things okay it's uh more than nine. It's i this is not a four-month program i wanted to get this in your brain quicker than four months so it's a one-month program um but it's it's we're going to go deep into everything that i talked about here so i'm going to put a link in the chat it's tylopez.com slash next Okay, tylopez.com slash next. I'm going to pin this also into my um, tylopez.com slash next, and I'm going to pin it on my Instagram. Give me a second. Ty Lopez. So this is the full version of what I'm doing. Tylopez.com. Slash next. Boom. Let me pin this. Oh, damn it. Pin comment. All right. It's pinned there. I'm going to read off the name of those of you who get in the program. Okay. Someone said, when is the e-commerce? The e-commerce program's closed. You guys missed out. Unless you're already in it. And you, but. 
it's not open right now. Okay, get the full program, tylopez.com slash next. Okay, let's go back to my updated. Okay, the third physical asset is cash. Here's what I recommend. People ask me, how much cash should you keep, if any? Um, my answer is, oh, let me put this back on. Damn, I lost my, there it is. The thing about cash is I, I don't, some people say cash is trash. I, I think that's that's fine that some people think that. Uh, but, hey, you may have to meet people. Or is that Danny making all that noise? Okay. So cash is something, Warren Buffett keeps 130 billion of cash right now. So he's not dumb. In fact, he's probably the greatest investor to ever walk planet Earth. And he keeps 130 billion in cash in Berkshire Hathaway, his company. I think you want to, Alec, you want to keep cash for opportunistic investments. Now, some people just want to put all their money in one asset class. That's fine. So every time they get money, they buy Bitcoin, for example. I do not recommend that strategy. I recommend a balanced strategy. Concentrated strategies do what they go up fast, but they go down real fast. I'm trying to keep you from not waking up and having a heart attack. I remember when I lived in, in, in Miami in two, during the recession, 2008, 2009, people were jumping off buildings here because they had lost all their money. Do you want to be tempted to jump off a building? If you do, then concentrate all your wealth in one asset class. My whole goal for you guys is not to concentrate too much of your wealth in one place. I just, I don't like it. So cash as an asset, um, I think a good thing for savings is to take money, open a new bank account, no online access, and put it in a CD at a small local bank far away from your house, which rip up the debit card, rip up the credit card, only have access is you have to go drive there nine to five, Monday through Friday, then you have to liquidate a CD. CDs are certificates of deposit that have FDIC insurance up to a certain amount. And then, you know, CDs also have a penalty. You lose all the interest if you cash them out early. So a great way to save money is to save it offline. If it's in another bank account that you can easily access, you're going to be tempted to spend it. So that's a little trick I've been teaching people for five, six years. Put it far away. Someone said, I use Stash. What do you think of them? I'm not, what is Stash? Is that an app or something? Be careful you ain't giving your money to somebody. Hey, Stash this for me. Because uh, you may never see that money again. You can Stash all, all you guys want to Stash your money with your uncle. He'll hold it for you. He'll make it hard for you to get. So Stash. Is Stash some kind of a, it looks like Robin Hood or something, huh? Yeah, Stash is different. That's not a savings. That's how to invest in, you know, digital assets, stock, aka stock market. Okay. Whew, man, this is a lot to talk about. It's only, we're getting only halfway through. I might not get through this whole thing. My brain's going to explode. Okay, um, what is today? The 25th, all right. Who's gonna be the first today to get in the asset back income program? I'm gonna pull this up and read names here in a second. Ty, would you recommend, oh. Okay, let me, let me go on to the next thing. We talked about cash briefly. Let me save this. Okay, stock market. I have a whole company devoted to this called Hidden Signals. It's a newsletter we send out every Monday giving our stock bond uh, trading tips, what we recommend. And this is a long conversation, but I, I'll say this. I don't like a ton of my net worth in the stock market. And right now, everybody thinks the stock market's real easy because it's volatile and money's pouring in. Just wait. Just wait till later this year. There is going to be some people jumping off cliffs. So 
a lot. I was just talking to guys like, oh, my friend invested in the stock market for the first time at, in Brazil and put in, I don't know, 30 grand. And now they have 130 grand in two months. And I'm going, do you think that's good? What goes up must come down, my friend. It's kind of like if you go on a date with somebody and the first date, they're like, I love you. Is that good or is that a bad sign that something's wrong? Someone shouldn't love you that fast. That means they're instab unstable. So all the people now that are like, Ty, I'm doing 30% a month in my money. I'm like, is that good? I, I see that as a horrific sign. If my money is doing 30% in my stock market, in the stock market, I, I know for a fact that what goes up is about to come crashing down. So guys, you got to use a little common sense. Common sense is no longer common. You just want to get 10, 12%, even 8% in the stock market continually. If you run what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, it, it kind of measures volatility and shows you your outlook on your long. So 8% isn't the same as 8%. Um, if you drop 20% the first year and then you do 40% the next year, it's not good because <laughs> you're basically back to where you started. So numbers lie a little bit. You want, a, to me, you want a somewhat non-volatile, steady state for your stocks. So all of you that think you're doing amazing because you're getting way up, you want to get above average returns. You do not want to get way above average returns because it means that the stock market is in an insane place of instability. And instability is not your friend. It's like dating a psychopath. Yeah, they're charming at first. Same with a the narcissist. They're real charming at first. And then they come and stab you in the back. So be careful, guys. Real careful. Okay. Um, bonds is it, similar. Now, most people don't invest directly into bonds. I actually look at buying today. I was looking at buying some term debt. It's called term debt or AKA you know, bonds, debentures, promissory notes. You can buy. There's a whole... 10 hour conversation we can have about bonds, but I want you to just understand the system that I'm giving you is not one Do you may feel overwhelmed now because I'm going through it real fast. In one month of you going through this, I can put you ahead of the entire global population, 99%, ahead of 99% of the world in a month, if you're willing, to take a little bit of time, a couple hours a week, and really get the big picture of what I'm saying. Okay, then you can go deeper and deeper for the rest of your life, but you got to get the big picture, man. It's kind of like I have a friend. He's horrible with women. He's still single. And when I say single, I mean, it ain't single by choice. He wants to be married. Never been able to convince a girl to marry him. Never. And we're talking, I don't know how old he is now, but he basically has gone kind of insane. And he doesn't get the big picture of male-female attraction. He just doesn't get it. He's always trying to do gimmicky stuff. He reads some little book and is like, oh, okay, this is the thing. Like, you got to get the big picture, man. And so what ABI is for me, it's a big picture approach to understanding, okay, there's nine asset classes. If one's doing well, I don't have to get excited, put all my money in it. I had a friend. I won't say his name. He sold a company when he was 26 years old for $18 million, 18. And he lived in California. So he had to pay quite a bit of tax. So let's just say he paid long-term capital gain, blah, blah, blah. but let's just say he had to pay 6 million in tax, 5 million in tax. So he's left with 13 million. He bought a house, a couple cars, 3 million. So he had 10 million left. He partied for a year or two, spent, you know, a million partying, blah, blah, blah. He was down to about 8 million. Then he, he heard about one asset class, a development real estate project between Los Angeles and Vegas. So his buddy's like, put like 3 million. This is 2007, by the way. Put 3 million in. So he puts 3 million in. He's all excited. Oh, yes, this is going to be great. Because he didn't know about nine asset classes. So this guy thought there was one. Because like he had grown up being like, oh, you get rich with real estate. So my friend, it's not really a friend. It's a, it's a acquaintance so this acquaintance puts three million in then a friend calls him back hey man i need you to put more money in it i need you to put five uh 
more million in because we'll be done with it in six months. So he put five more million. That was all. He was like, oh, I only have eight million left. But you know what? Real estate, you can't lose. So I'm going to put it in. Boom. He put it in. Guess what happened in 2008? U.S. housing recession hit. That thing was worth nothing. I mean, they might have sold it for a million bucks. He lost all his money. He's back to a job. He has a nine to five job right now. Or last time I talked to him. Nine to five job. He forgot the rule. One, he forgot Warren Buffett's rule. You only got to get rich once. And then secondly, he forgot the rule of um, there being what I'm teaching you now is there's nine asset classes. He should have spread his money across nine areas. If he had spread his money about across nine areas, he would have lost maybe a million out of his 18 million. Okay. Maybe a million. So when you don't understand this ABI master plan, even when you only have a hundred bucks, you're going to do it wrong. Somebody said that's depressing. Yeah, it is depressing. Imagine how my friend felt have 18, imagine getting $18 million wired to your account. And within three years, your bank account has, you know, a hundred bucks in it. Mike Tyson said that he made between, let's call it $200 million. Nobody knows. There's many different guesses, a hundred to 500 million. And he said, after his career was over, he got out of prison. He wasn't fighting anymore. He spent all his money. You know how much money he said he had? He said he went to get a hotel when he was in Los Angeles and it was a hundred bucks a night and he couldn't afford it. If Mike Tyson had this ABI plan that I'm giving you right now, it, it's impossible for it to happen. Basically, I mean, anything's possible. But right now, Mike Tyson would have, from his fighting years, he would have 75, 100, 150 million. You know? So I hope each of you goes, I need to know what 99% of planet Earth doesn't know. You know, I need to know what 99% of planet earth doesn't know. And that's kind of why I built this program and why I'm doing this live call right now. I'm gonna put this up on slides here. I'm gonna grab my Google slides, give me a second. Um, I'm just gonna stick this up here. I'll share my screen again in a second. Boom. So the ABI master plan. It's a nine hour program. One month, I recommend you do about two hours, approximately two hours a week. Okay. And I'm going to put the link to it. it is tylopez.com slash next because to me this is like your next step financially a lot of you are in my programs you're starting to make money and i've seen this people make money in my programs and then they lose it all and i'm like come on guys it's one thing to make your money it's another thing to make it in and lose it it sucks i've seen it i had a guy who got in my smma program and he made a uh, million 1.2 million dollars when he was 20 years old or i think he's 21 years old and he lost it all investing it incorrectly. So I realized that's why I was like, you know what? Not only do I need to create programs that help people build labor-based income, but I need uh, something that allows people to build asset-based income. They're totally different. Labor-based income is what 99% of planet Earth has. I hope that your life becomes very asset-rich very asset rich what do i mean by asset rich it's not labor rich you know someone said why one month should take a day for nine hours of content i don't want you guys you can do nine hours there there's more there's bonuses in there just to be clear so it's more than nine hours but there's an hour deep discussion there'll be more but i i kind of like nine there's nine asset classes so i put in nine hardcore training videos and I recommend if you go through it all the first day then or the first week, you should do it again. You need to listen to it a few times. Put a headset on, be in the gym. Listen. I listen to stuff again. There's a book. I listened to Will Durant, um, the story of the history of, of um, 
the lessons of history, I've listened to that or read it or listened to it 50 times in my life. All right, welcome to the group. We've got Adam Rosenstock in Edmonton, Alberta. Welcome to the group here. Um, okay, uh, before I start reading names, let me answer. We can go to the next asset class. I didn't stick too long in the stock market because that one is so long of a kind of conversation. What is expected to come out of the program? Asset-based income. That's what ABI stands for, by the way. Let me put that there. So you generate your first, begin to generate money without, not labor-based. Remember, labor-based is the worst kind. And you can be an entrepreneur and be totally labor-based. You cannot be labor-based for the rest of your life, people. You will have a horrible life. I just erase this. Control Z doesn't work. Oh. Okay, I think my fringe grows. There we go, okay. Uh, Google Slides is slightly annoying. Put, shrink this. Who here right now made $1 from an asset that you don't spend? Anybody wanna share? their screen. It could be, it doesn't have to even be net income, just income from something you're not spending all day on. Welcome to the group, Adele Sharif in Stone Newton, Essex or Newton, Essex, Great Britain. Julius S from Winthrop, Washington. So for me, and I'm not saying you're probably not gonna be able to do the things that I've done because I've been doing it for a while, but here's one, here's yesterday. Oops, my screen freeze again. Instagram is so buggy these days. So here's an asset generated 133,000 yesterday. I'll click on today. That's not a screenshot there, you can see. Today it's generated, what is that, 126. That's one of my assets. I spent zero minutes on that asset, zero. I built a team, they run it. I do a weekly call on Wednesdays at 9 p.m one hour call. And I actually didn't make the call the last couple of weeks. So this, in the last four weeks, I've put in zero hours, okay? Now, little disclaimer, you're not gonna get in this program and have assets that are building you, making you 126,000, this is not gonna happen. So I just wanna be clear, but you might be able to generate a thousand a month, a hundred a month, 10,000 a month. I mean, it, the goal is ascension. Meaning who cares right now, let's say you're at zero, 10 bucks is an infinite increase if you do the math. So go up every year, that's all that matters. I got to six figures in 2002. I started young as a teenager. I got to, it took me nine months and every single year uh, I've gone up in net worth, which is really the ultimate you know, measure. I went up every, I went up, you know, year by year. I'm not sure, maybe there was a year it dipped a little, but as far as I know, for all intents and purposes, it's gone up every year. That's the goal. What's the difference between this program and your other programs? Um, my other programs are more about starting an entrepreneurial venture. So it's about increasing your labor income. So labor income is okay. You can have labor income. And you'll need to have it at the beginning, but you should, most people have 100% labor-based income, okay? Somebody said, nine months, bro, what did you do at first? I started in finance and specifically internet. I was working for GE Capital, GE Financial, and I figured out, I started with lead generation, lead gen. Okay, one of the things I do is car sharing and I have a small team that helps me run it. You clean, wash cars. Okay, that's an operating asset, which is good. Most entrepreneurs who have assets in this call are all operating ones, but um, but they're still they're not really assets because they're labor based income for the most part. Meaning you have a service based business, which is fine. Service based business is fine, but 
service-based business isn't really an asset because if you get sick and you can't service the business, then you get no money. SMMA, for, if, unless you have a CEO running it for you, an SMMA is labor-based income, which is fine. But it shouldn't be all your income. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, sorry, I'm doing something else. All right, what questions before I wrap up? Staring at the screen. I hardly use a laptop anymore. I hardly sit down anymore. Okay. Give me a second, sorry. Give me one second, guys. Hang with me. Doing something else. By the way, did anybody state what their asset based income is? Who has a thousand bucks a month from non labor based income? thousand bucks a month non-labor based income me how much somebody says stacking crypto okay thousand dollars asset income now crypto just so you know crypto doesn't always generate cash flow unless you sell that's one thing about gold and crypto they're not income producing assets they're basically capital that you the only way you make any money is by you know exchanging at hopefully higher rate than you paid but you could still put crypto. I mean, there's people that trade crypto actively. For I have crypto, some stocks. Who has a number? Who's doing a thousand dollars a month? Who is doing a thousand dollars a month? Anybody? Thousand a month from crypto. Uh, sorry, from any asset, <laughs> not from crypto. Who's doing a thousand? My whole family is doing a thousand? Or are you saying your family's your asset? Okay. Five to 12,000. Jonathan, what is that from specifically? What, what's the 5,000? Somebody said yesterday they made 2,000 in Forex in less than 10 hours. Okay, somebody's been trading. Easiest ABI to start up? Eh, probably real estate. Real estate. Real estate's a great one. Buy a house on your block. Buy a house a couple blocks away from you. Get an owner finance deal. Man, I'll tell you, I wish I'd started younger. With, even if I made mistakes, who cares? Just don't go insane. You know, start small. Very small. Start with a little dump of a place. What's the most trustable wallet for Bitcoin? Oh, that's a controversial question. I mean, lots of people use Coinbase. I think Coinbase is safe in the sense that it's not some fly by night. You know, there's there's a <laughs> there's a company in Canada. I forget. I feel bad. 
the guy had like whatever 200 million in crypto in and then he died because he was partying so much and he was the only one that could access the money so everybody that money's permanently locked up and inaccessible for any human so somebody here said coinbase sucks i mean yeah coinbase is not perfect there's many wallets that people use many okay someone said please leave it open for tomorrow oh so somebody said natural juices you make a thousand dollars a month what do you sell? But that sounds like you're doing the labor. That doesn't count as an asset. That's labor-based income. Who, anybody generating 10,000 a month from assets? Surely gold is not an ABI asset as is generating, it doesn't generate unless you sell. I, you could argue that you could argue that most crypto and most gold and silver is not a, an income generating asset, but it can be traded. So I threw it in there. I mean, gold's been around as an asset for how long? You know, 10,000 years. It's kind of in its own category. Is e com an asset? Um, it could be an operating asset if somebody else runs it for you. Somebody else has to run it for you or at least run the majority of the work. You can do some of it. All right, Eugene Boca, welcome to the group from Brooklyn, New York. Kevin Slayton, welcome to the group from Los Angeles, California. Iris Moore, oh no, that's sorry, that's a different program. Joel Fuentes, welcome to the group from Denver, Colorado. Harmony Math Matson from New York. Welcome to the group. Dur Darby Beacon Beankin from Mountain View, California. Welcome to the group. Dakota Baldwin from Dayton, Ohio. Welcome to the group. So cool. Those all, if I didn't get everyone, Julius S. from Winthrop, Washington. Welcome to the group. Eight, did I read this one? I can't remember. Adam Rosen Stock, Edmonton, Alberta. If I, if I did not get to you, I'm starting to lose my voice. What's one last subject you guys want me to talk about before I go um, about investing? SMMA cold email ideas. Best way to get a customer, send an email. Your website's broken. Then the message is, hey, I was shopping on your website and I noticed that you don't do blank, insert, whatever, run Facebook ads or you don't use Shopify. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a specialist, an econ specialist. I'm an SMMA specialist. Can I give you a free evaluation on how to fix this? Most, you would send 20 emails like that. You'll get three or four of that reply. You should get a customer out of that if you pitch it correctly. Do we get live coaching with you? Yes, everybody who gets in the ECS, every Friday you're at, get access to my uh, Q and A, so you can ask me questions on the program as you're going through it. If you're confused, so on. Yeah, he's talking about how to influence people. Influence comes from um, something that they call. What's that? My frozen Instagram is so annoying. Instagram breaks up more than um, what should we call it? more than uh, Zoom on the same internet too. Best altcoin to invest in. I'm not a big fan of altcoins, but you can do altcoins. I don't teach it. Uh, I'll have some other people teach the altcoin. I, I don't love altcoins, you know? What do I think about 5G investments? Well, 5G is this. I try to stay away from stuff that everybody's talking about. Like real estate, I like to do warehouses and farmland. Nobody does warehouses and farmland. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Money comes from not following the crowd, my friends. All right. I think Instagram's frozen, so I'm going to kill it. Boom. So. Yeah, maybe that's, I'll end with this. 
guys, you got to go against the crowd, my friend. Everything everybody's talking about, you shouldn't do. It's that simple. It means it's too late. Money's already moved into it, you know? So Francisco Lario, welcome to the group from Miami, where I am. Michael Lawrence, welcome to the group, Durham, North Carolina. I, I went to high school in Raleigh, North Carolina. Enlo, Alan Soto, Modesto, California, welcome to the group. Modesto, that's probably hot right now, boy. What's the first thing to invest in? I recommend, I mean, the stock market, you can start in this month and you can start in real estate, you know, this year. I mean, you can start working on deals. You want to start building and negotiating multiple deals at the same time. Then you can pick the best one. Never do one deal at a time when you're doing mergers and acquisitions or you're doing um, uh, minority interest investments or you're doing IP investments or you're, well, and for sure, if you're doing real estate and all the types, you need to have many options or you'll get too desperate. Owen Quigley, welcome to the group. In Limerick, Ireland, Francisco, oh no, I talked about you. How is Ireland? I've been to Ireland such a long time. How does agricultural real estate generate income? You can have timber on it. You can have leases. So livestock, the thing about farmland is it's very slow to grow, but it doesn't go up or down. It's like a super slow and steady thing. Okay, it's almost two hours. I think I'm gonna wrap up. Tylopez.com slash next. We'll keep this slide up for you. If I didn't read your name, I hope to see your name here in the next little while. Ivar Laconga in Rome, New York. Welcome to the group. So jump in, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it, okay? All right, I will talk to you guys soon. Did it make me leave?